Loss comes in many forms, and usually in unexpected ways. It can be devastating, leaving you facing an uphill struggle to go on with life without someone you thought would always be there. But life does go on, and even in the deepest despair, we can find hope. Welcome to Grief Relief with your hosts, Drs. Gloria and Heidi Horsley, brought to you by the Open to Hope Foundation, helping people find hope after loss. And now here's Dr. Gloria and Dr. Heidi. Welcome to our show. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley with my co-host. Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we've got a great show today and a really important one because there are a lot of people who've lost their spouse and it's a, it's a tough thing. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. we uh, work with Michelle Neff Hernandez on her Soaring Spirits Foundations and, and do workshops and uh, people are really, really struggle when they lose that special person in their life. Absolutely. You, you almost lose part of yourself. And we are going to talk about this today. And one of our guests today said, you know, even though you've lost that person, you kind of integrate them into your life and into your, into your heart, and they, they do live on forever with you. Absolutely. Well, I, that thought came from, you know, I had talked on the phone about yeah. it, how important we thought that thought was. Mm -hmm. And that's from uh, Reverend Rob Gieselman, who's going to be on the show, and he talks about losing his wife and, and made that comment, and I want to explore that more with him. Mm -hmm. And then he'll, he uh, knows a lot about the spiritual aspects of, aspects of loss, and it'll be great to talk to him about it. And then uh, Dr. Lynn Prashant, who is a good yes. friend of ours for many years, right? We love Lynn, and she talks a lot about how we hold grief in our body. And I love what she's doing, because she, do, she does a lot of body work. So it's not just about talking about the loss, it's like where do we hold these losses and what can we do to shift our energy? Because you know, uh, losing a spouse uh, is such a physical experience too. Mm -hmm. I know you uh, said there was some research about uh, people miss most holding hands, right? Yeah, I thought that was interesting. That's the one thing that people say they miss most when a, when a husband or a wife dies is just holding their hand. Yeah, and so that physical contact mm -hmm. is so important, and maybe our guests will give people who are out there who've had a loss some insight on what they can do about it. Well, let's get started. Oh, by the way, I don't want to forget yeah. that we're going to close the show today with the Pally Rocks Band from Palo Alto High School, and with um, my grandson, Scotty Barra, is going to be introducing the song, so we're excited about that, too, and we thank all mm -hmm. these kids for taking their Saturday, basically, to come and play on the show for us, so, mm -hmm. and music is so important to lighten the heart and to honor people. People, and we thank them for doing that. So let's get started with Reverend Gieselman. Okay, very good. Hi, can Reverend. We, can we call you Rob? Hi. Absolutely. Please <laughs> call me Rob. All right, Rob, great. We want to inter thank you for being on our show today and again taking your time to, to come and talk about uh, your losses and hope and healing and that kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I've, we've really liked your book, haven't we, Heidi? Oh my goodness, it's, it's a great and book. And show it to us, yeah. It's a really easy read and bring tissue because it is it will tug at your heart yeah it does you're you're, you're an excellent yes. writer oh, thank you you, really, you are. really are and we love the piece about well what do you talk about how it is well first talk about your losing your wife and and uh, that experience and her name and the kids and, you, and all that well uh, obviously losing a spouse is is one of the most significant events in life uh, and most of us don't expect to do it as young as I was. I was uh, 43 years old mm -hmm. when Laura died and uh, and it was sudden, it was unexpected. Even though she'd been sick, she had not been sick to the point of dying and she died after gallbladder surgery. Mm. So waking up to find her and then to address the kids was, was I mean, not only life changing, it, it, it it, it moved me into a completely different universe. Mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden, I was a single father, and um, and even as a, a spiritual person in a church, you know, um, I was challenged with what does that really mean. So it really was a, a big change in my life. And, yeah. and and I imagine you probably worked with a lot of people that had been grieving and had loss, but until you've experienced it. It's a whole other thing once you experience it. You know, it's really true. I had uh, planned on writing a book about death anyway because I had um, had the privilege, and it's a privilege to be in a room when someone loses somebody. There's something, mm -hmm. uh, when, it, when it's a death that's anticipated, there's something um, intimate about that moment, and I wanted to write about that, but when, when Laura died, um, that became the obvious platform, frankly, mm -hmm. and, uh, and a sad platform. Mm -hmm. uh, we had someone tell us, uh, one reverend that we had on our show who made the comment 
that um, he really didn't quite get how painful it was until it happened to him. That's exactly right. In fact, one of my favorite stories is, is you know, every Sunday after church, I stand at the door and greet people as they're leaving and ask how they're doing. Well, after Laura died for, uh, for a long, long time, people wanted to know how I was doing. And they would say, how are you doing? And I would answer, fine, regardless of who was asking me. And those people who had not lost a spouse and wanted me to be okay said, mm -hmm. good, I'm really happy that you're doing better. And those who had lost a spouse would look at me and say, I know. Mm -hmm. And I knew they, they knew something that, that other people just didn't get about yeah. me now. So what are some tips that you have for people? I mean, uh, for one thing, I think there's some people uh, who haven't been to church for a long time who, the can they go back to their religion? I mean, you know, do you have them, if they need that consolation? I've seen many people after they lose a spouse return to religion. And, and uh, it's not a groping for God, it is a looking for a deeper meaning and a, a way to place this hole in their heart in the universe. Mm -hmm. And so yes, Absolutely, it's an opportune time because, because while some people do react and, and, and perhaps blame God for the death of the spouse, many people just have this hole, this place that, that something's missing and they're looking, they're looking for that. And, and faith uh, provides solace, mm -hmm. it really does. You know, um, Heidi and I talk about community and uh, I once, we, I interviewed a man um, who was a, a reverend, and I said, when my son died, uh, I really did not find the theology of my religion helpful. And I, I said, but I found the people fabulous. And he said to me, <laughs> he laughed, and he said, that is your religion, that is God. God works through his people. It is all of that. It is absolutely <laughs> all. And one person will find it through the faith, and another person will find it through the community. And, and the tenets of the faith aren't important at that point. They really aren't. Yeah. They're not going to provide that guidance, but the people are, and the care, and the love, and the support, uh -huh. um, and the prayers, and the place, and the... You know, I, I believe there's actually some research also that shows that people of faith do have, uh, show a little less mm. stress going mm. through, and I, I have a feeling that's probably due to community. Well, as you know, it, it, going through the grief process um, is hard no matter who you are, regardless of faith, but... Uh, but it does help to have both family and a community. Mm -hmm. And you said making doubt. meaning somehow. Making of meaning. Of the loss I think is really important. Absolutely, and, um, and for me, that meaning is not only in writing about it, but it also is through my kids, raising mm -hmm. the kids and wanting to, to impart something to them that would be lasting that they were not gonna have otherwise because they lost their mom. Mm -hmm. Is there anything unique about being a single guy? As um, opposed to a woman, are there any any differences? Gosh, I, 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 the pain is I don't think any different. I mean, I think the pain of losing somebody is the same regardless, but our roles aren't as naturally um, um, towards the maternal. You know, we don't naturally turn towards the maternal. So, so, so from a parenting standpoint, perhaps as far as from a spousal standpoint. Um, I think there clearly is. I, I, I know from my own observation, men are far more likely to get married within a year mm -hmm. than women are. And it's often because they're trying to replace what mm -hmm. they had. It's not a bad thing necessarily. It's just there, there's this yeah. back to this hole. And what was the hardest thing about raising children as a single parent? Oh. I know uh, it's probably, I don't know if that's hard to say because it's probably a, a lot of things, right? You know, the heart, the, for me, the emotionally, the most, emotionally wrenching part was was uh, when they wanted a mom yeah. and there I am you know and and they're crying for their mom and they're crying for their mom yeah. and, they're, and and we had we had and you can't those. you can't fix it you can't fix that and at all you want to fix it for your kids and make it better and help them exactly and also I imagine while you're, you're grieving it's hard I think for parents because you, here you are grieving but yet you're also needing to help your children through their grief, grief process and I will say maybe that's a plus of having walked with so many people through mm -hmm. grief but I knew enough of what was going on with me that at times I could put it aside and say, you know, talk to me mm -hmm. and ask them about it. And what I would say to any parent who loses a spouse and is raising children is, is keep the conversation open mm -hmm. with the kids. That can be really hard with teenagers too, wow. 
Well, and my kids were, I will say my kids were younger, well, yeah, you know, they were eight and five, so yeah. it, that was a little easier for me, but you're Well, right. listen, thank you so much for uh, sharing that with us oh. today, and we want you to stay while we introduce Lynn Prashant, because we want to take some questions from the audience. I'd like that. So, uh, so Heidi, we're going to have Lynn Prashant on in a minute, and talking about her degriefing, mm -hmm. and Love it. we're going to see the roll-in from, uh, that she's given us a roll-in, talking a little bit about her degriefing process, and then, then we'll get some tips for our audience out there, if they've had a loss, how they can use her degriefing. Great, okay. All right. Hello, I'm Dr. Lynn Prashant. I'm a somatic thanatologist. I work with grief and loss of any kind. What I've learned over my years of working in this field is that talk therapy for many, many decades was the standard opportunity for grieving individuals to deal with their grief. What I realized after the loss of my husband in 1984 was that I particularly needed physical, somatic ways to release the pain of the grief that I was experiencing. Talking alone does not enable the body to release the accumulation of grief that occurs within our cells, tissues, and organs over our lifetime. Teaching individuals, according to who they are, specific tools to transform the grief, their own somatic grief, is the major focus of my work. Meeting each individual exactly where they're at, making sure they have an opportunity to be heard, and giving appropriate feedback and tools, life skills, if you will, because there is no end to grief, it's part of the human condition. And working with it skillfully, asking questions, and meeting that individual in their heart of hearts is what my work is about. I look forward to telling you more. Thank you so much. Video of Lynn and hear her talk about her uh program and what she's doing, so let's go yes. greet her okay. in person. Hey. 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 Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you hey. so much. My name is Ken. Well then, Hi. you lost your husband. Man, your husband's a good looking man. Good looking man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we uh, have a little picture of him. I don't know if they're going to show it up on the screen or not. I guess they haven't found it yet, but anyway, he is. And uh, you were pretty young, too, as Rob was. I was 35. He was 36. Mm. Wow. Uh, and one of the, although we knew he'd had cancer before, the re-diagnosis was mm -hmm. quite shocking mm -hmm. because we flirted with the possibility of it not reoccurring. Mm -hmm. And so it was cancer that returned. And it really confronted us with how we were living our lives and what our hopes and dreams were, what we could accomplish together, and what we had to recognize that we would never. Wow, mm -hmm. that's tough. It was very challenging. Yeah. And unlike Rob, his wife died, uh, you know, suddenly, even though she'd been ill. But your husband, you had this process, and you actually ended up working with some of the rock stars of of grief and loss, as it were, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and uh, also uh, Stephen Levine, right? Exactly. Yeah. And it occurred to me, in the midst of all of it, the gift of having those professionals with us, mm -hmm. and the irony of, again, touching on the making meaning, what Mark said to me before he died is that if you can find some way to share or communicate what we've been through, it will give it more meaning or validity in his mind, it was for the higher purpose, wow. that if I could bring it forth and share. Yeah. Now so. talk to us, because I, I think this is so important, because Heidi and I are in the talking business, right. in the therapy business, and here you are, you've kind of moved one step beyond it, and talk about how grief is actually stored in our cells, which by the way, I think is very 2000, because it's uh, the idea that um, we're all learning all sorts of things about the brain and how our chemistry is carrying mm -hmm. memories yes. and, and that we can actually change chemistry with things like hugs and gratitude and you know there are actually ways to change your brain chemistry for people out there so what's your thought out there I've had a I've had a loss I've lost a spouse I'm, you know I'm through that early initial maybe six months or a year 
and I'm still feeling really sad and lonely and what, what help me well what I realized about my own process was I had been a physical education teacher and been a very physical person and I could talk about my losses continually it was my loss of, of my husband I realized that the ache in my heart remained I would talk about it intellectually I'd have new approaches or ideas yet the actual sense of a heavy heartedness mm -hmm. didn't shift until I sought out uh, massage therapy and realized during that process that something was being addressed within my whole system that talking didn't uh, mm -hmm. accomplish and it had occurred to me that if it was so important for me there had to be a population of people that would benefit similarly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I started asking myself some operative and instrumental questions. What do I need in order to change how I'm feeling? Who is it that I can work with? And what I actually found was there were not a lot of people that related to my request. Mm -hmm. And it was about my heart aching. And I wanted to experience compassionate touch. And it turns out that the woman who actually massaged me didn't tell me anything about her story until I asked. And when I asked, she said, I was waiting for you to ask. She said, years ago, I lost my husband and my son in an accident. And it took physical touch wow. before I felt safe again in my body. Hmm. Wow. Well, okay, so here I am. I'm not going to have massage therapy. I mean, because I don't do that. Okay. But I'm thinking, what can I do sitting here? I mean, I'm, one of the things Heidi and I talked about is asking people for hugs. Mm -hmm. Hugs are fabulous. Hugs really, in the truest sense, the arms are an extension of the heart. When we wrap our arms around somebody, or somebody does that for us. And you can also us. wrap them around yourself. I was going to say, totally. it's interesting you that you would do that. I love that. Uh, um, a self-hug. And I often mm -hmm. say when I do phone counseling, please give yourself a hug for me. Ah, nice. And I'll do the same. Yeah. The way we approach the body is specific to each indi individual's inclinations. So the point that's important to state is that it's the intention of what we are looking for and asking ourselves what form might work. It could be dance, it could be journaling, it could be yoga, it could be walking in the breast cancer marathons that are done. Mm -hmm. It could be any application of our physical intention to express. Kubler's, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's work stressed externalizing what we were feeling rather than internalizing. Mm -hmm. Expressing rather than repressing. Great. Well, Lynn, thank you. You've given us some great ideas and People can find you online at degriefing. Either degriefing.com or Integrative Grief Therapy, and they can find the manual that I wrote about this She's got this a great work. manual, and it's got all sorts of things that you can do in that manual. So thank you so much. And let's take Thanks, a few, Lynn. Let's take thank a few you, questions from okay. the audience, for both wanna, of you. I just want to say I love what Lynn does, and I've watched her do it, and I've watched somebody really heal after doing it, Alan Peterson. Mm. So OK. Uh, questions? Mm. Can you stand, please? Sure. Thank you. Reverend, um, did you ever lose faith after losing your wife? I didn't lose faith. Um, my orientation to God is, is somewhat of a positive one. I've, I've, I find God to be good. And so, so I never blamed God. But, but there's a great story in the Hebrew Scriptures about Jacob wrestling with God. And um, I found for years after that, there were times when I was wrestling with God over that and 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 all that was going on. So, mm -hmm. so I didn't lose my faith, but I but I certainly wrestled. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people it's okay to be angry at God. He has strong shoulders; he can handle it. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Uh, Reverend, what do you think the hardest thing for your kids was when you lost your wife? Well. It, they might not admit it, but it's probably being stuck with me. <laughs> but uh, uh, probably really was the hardest thing is what I said earlier, which is just uh, the times when they so wanted a mommy and, and, um, and, and they didn't understand why she wasn't there. 
anymore. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I didn't understand. That's tough. Yeah. And that was Teddy Johnson, by the way. Thank you, Teddy. Okay. Lynn, what was the worst thing about losing your husband? I was 35, and I struggled to find other widows, if you will, that I could relate to, because the two women in my family that were widows were my father's mother, my grandmother, and my father's sister, my aunt. Yet they'd already had many more years with their spouse. I had three years with Mark. So it was about putting it into perspective and recognizing that not on a level that I was familiar with, but on another level, he'd be in my heart forever. The lack of his physical presence was challenging because it was always a soothing part of my reality to be near him, to hold his hand, to tell each other jokes that only the two of us found funny. It was losing the reflection that I really trusted mm -hmm. and losing that part of myself when he loved me. I'd love how it felt. And so losing that part of me that he wasn't there to remind me about. Mm -hmm. That uh, was hard. Heidi, I think uh, that's great. Thank you all for uh, giving us the questions from our audience. We have a great studio audience. One of the things that I'd like to put in a little plug for right now, given what Lynn was saying, is Michelle Neff Hernandez's Soaring Spirits Foundation. Because you can find that on the internet, and she's doing great things for widow and, uh, widowers through the internet and her conferences, isn't she, Heidi? Absolutely. And, you know, the one thing about her conferences, it's widows of all ages. Because sometimes young widows have a really hard time finding anyone they can identify yeah, with. Absolutely. Yes. Right. Well, listen, thank you both for being on the show today. It's just been wonderful having you on. And I know there's so many people out there that you're helping. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much yeah, for thank asking you both. us. Thank right. you. And now we bring you Chris Donahoe from the Grief Relief Archive. I can race through the day, can live in the rush. And what can you do? What can you do? I can lie in the dark, say life isn't fair. And what can you do? What can you do? But teach me. Every brilliant day, the only thing, the only thing, when all is stripped away, gratitude. I can give you my money you a hand and what do you do what do you do I can give you a kiss can give you a song and what do you do what do you Truth, the only truth, when all is stripped away. 
This has been Grief Relief, hosted by the mother-daughter team of Dr. Gloria and Dr. Heidi Horsley. This show has been brought to you by the Open to Hope Foundation, helping people find hope after loss. Be sure to visit Dr. Gloria and Dr. Heidi at opentohope.com, where you can listen to radio programs, watch past episodes of Grief Relief, read articles, and view books. You can also join them on Twitter and Facebook and put your events on their international calendar. Thanks for watching, and remember, Others have been there and made it, and you can too.